Good morning, church. So every now and then, Mike has sort of a hot button topic to address, and he brings in the big dogs. So I'm here to talk about ushering 101. (laughs) Not sure what that means. James chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who loved him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? And, and, and are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you've become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So I was, um, I was in a Walmart, this was several years ago, and I was doing um, some grocery shopping and I'd, I'd come to an item on the list that I couldn't find. And I called my wife, Crystal, and this was, um, this was before uh, we had any iPhones in our home. All our phones were really old, but it was a cell phone. And I, I called Crystal and, and said, I can't find this, this item. How important is it? Um, it was important. That's why I put it on the list. And, um, well, I'm in the aisle. I'm near all of the things that you, that you said it would be near, and it's not here. And so I've got my, I've got my phone out. And I'm, I'm talking on my phone, and I'm looking in, in, in this area in which she says it is going to be, and it's not there. And we got into a little bit of a spat, a little bit of an argument. And uh, she won, by the way, in case you were wondering. And I'm, lo- I'm looking and talking, and I'm a little bit frustrated. And I didn't notice that while I was looking on one side of the aisle, a woman had come in behind me, and she was looking on the other side. And she was, this was a Walmart, and she was scantily clad whatever that means. She wasn't wearing a whole lot of clothes. And uh, she could have been a poster child for people of Walmart. Have you seen that (laughs) website? If you haven't, you might be on it. You never know. (laughs) So I'm I'm on the phone, I'm frustrated. I didn't see her. She's looking, this this is awful. She's looking for something on the very bottom row. She's not wearing hardly anything. And she's bending over to get something on the bottom. I promise, I promise I did not see her there. I have an old phone and I'm frustrated with my wife and I turn to get my cart and I'm trying to push the button to turn that thing off and it's sort of freezing and spinning and I can't get it and I'm just frustrated with Crystal. I'm just pressing buttons and, and, and she's bent down and then all of a sudden we both hear really loudly, Now she's on my phone. I just took a picture of her. And she turns and looks at me. And I'm holding my phone, pointing it at her. And I want to say, I, 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 I wasn't taking a picture, but I have a picture of her right there on my phone, right? And uh, she, she looks at me and assumes that I was 
lusting after her and wanted to keep a picture. And so she storms off and I sort of want to yell, hey, if you wore clothes to Walmart, this wouldn't be an issue. <laughs> right? And I don't do those sorts of things. I'm a preacher. <laughs> At the Baptist church down the road, right? <laughs> No one likes to be judged. Have you noticed that about us? In one grand moment, we both, strangers, immediately hate each other for judgment offered. Judge, judgment is the great thief, isn't it? It has certainly robbed us of our witness. Judgment's a killer is so closely linked to our identity as human beings that it infiltrates our gathering as a church. And it kills. It just kills us. And it kills the hurting people who come in to be with us for a moment in time in their lives. I wonder if you've ever been judged I wonder if you've ever been ushered to a certain seat or a certain place within the gathering of people that was received as a judgment immediately. I wonder if you've ever been moved either practically or metaphorically to the least important seats in the gathering. Have you ever been too poor? I wonder if you have ever been too old or too black or too gay. Judgment kills. And James knows this. And so he invites us to think again about who we are and what is our story and who is the hero of our story. I can't help but wonder, what was it like when they gathered together for this word to be read for the first time? What was the first gathering like? Were there multiple gatherings and who made up this first one? And what happened right before someone stood to read the letter? What happened right before it? And how might they have described themselves before James describes them for them? I wonder if, this probably didn't happen, I didn't read it in any of the commentaries that I read on the way here, but I wonder if they had, <laughs> that's sort of a dangerous thing to say, isn't it? Mike is really nervous right now. I wonder if, it was it possible that they had a marketing consultant come in right before James read his letter, you know, to sort of do an evaluation of the church, where the church has been, where the church is going, and her identity, and the marketing consultant stands before the church and asks her to describe herself just before James reads, just before James' letter is read to them, what might they have said about themselves? They probably would have said what every church I've ever been a part of says about herself. We're a very loving and accepting and diverse group of people. <laughs> We're very diverse. We've got some people who are 50, and some who are 55. We've got some white people and some tan people. Some of the tans are real, some of them are fake. You know, James isn't just interested in whether you welcome them in. Those who are considered, for whatever reason, lowly in the eyes of the world. James isn't just considered about whether you welcome them in. He's, con he's concerned about where you seat them. It's not just an all are welcome in this place. It is everyone is given value in this place. It's not just the rich who will be elders here. I've yet to meet a homeless elder. I don't know if I've met many poor elders. 
dear brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ. Do you remember why you fell in love with him? If you have ever been judged, if you were ever guilty, if you were ever lowly, do you remember why you fell in love with our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ? And do you remember why you call him glorious? Do you remember the kinds of stories that he tells? Do you remember that he was poor and lowly? I wonder if James wrote this letter today, if he might add to this audience, if he might add to you and I, you know, be careful about your ushering. And by the way, could you also not belittle the poor on Facebook? Could you be the champion for the one that you don't know And you don't know what it's like to be him or her, but all you know is life has been awfully difficult. Could you be their champion instead of their judge? Because judgment kills. Believers in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ, do you remember that he was poor and that he was a protester too? And that those in authority also thought that he was a troublemaker and that he should be silenced. When uh, about 20 years ago, Crystal and I moved to St. Louis, we live in Atlanta now, this was our first ministry job and one of my tasks among many was to uh, once a week drive down to the city and the north city, the inner city of St. Louis, and lead a little Bible study um, with 11, 12, and 13-year-old children in the inner city. Every, every week, I would drive my van down to the city, pick up about 10 or 15 of them, go to the park, or go to one of the houses there, and, and we'd have a little conversation together, have some snacks, have some basketball. It wasn't the easiest group to corral and convince to be baptized all at once, but I did my best. One day I was driving down to the city. I went to one of the houses to pick up the kids and there was a a group of college kids down there from Oklahoma. They were from Oklahoma University and they'd come to do some work with a team down there and they were painting a house. And and I made my way into the house to pick up, to gather some of the children to go to the Bible study. And there was a young man named Todd sitting in a wheelchair on the porch visiting with some people. Some of you know Todd Lawler. Todd um, is, is really a very sharp, brilliant young man with CP. And because of his CP, you don't, you don't actually know all of who he is in the first glance. He's got a bit of a stutter. His speech is slurred. And so you might know that there is a brilliant evangelistic heart beneath that and a great mind. I met Todd and some of the other students. I didn't know anything about him. And in some broken speech, he let me know that he would like to come with me to the Bible study. I said, that would be great. I've got a van. We'll load your wheelchair up. And then on the way, he let me know he would like to lead the Bible study. (laughs) I wanted to say, look, Todd, I'm a trained theologian. And this group is a hard group. And your, your, your speech is not that great. This is a rough crowd. I also wanted to say, hey, that is a day off for me. <laughs> Instead, I said, that would be great, Todd. Why don't, you, why don't you lead the study? And so we gather into this home. We circle the kids up. And um, Todd begins to slur his speech and stutter a little bit and deliver one of the most beautiful gospel messages to this group of children about how much he already loves them and how the Lord Jesus Christ loves them right where they are and highly values them. It was beautiful. You know what, they, you know what their response was? They laughed. They thought he was, it was funny the way he talked. They thought it was funny the way he moved his arms. They thought it was hysterical when he would get caught on a word and be stuck there for a painful amount of time. They giggled. Willie, one of the boys, began to mock Todd while he was speaking, imitating him in front of Todd. I wanted to. In Christian love. hurt them. (laughs) I felt like, for me, 
for the job for me is to say nothing. For me to, to intervene would be to make it worse. And so I said nothing. I just watched Todd endure. He didn't slow down a bit. He loved on those children. At the very end, he asked them all to grab hands and circle up to pray. And we did. And, and Willie landed right next to Todd. And Todd grabbed his hand. And, and we prayed. And, 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 and when it was over, all the children ran out to the, to the basketball court to play basketball. And Willie went to run out. And Todd had a hold of his, his arm. I thought, yes. <laughs> Judgment for the one, right? It was, sort of, it was sort of a whiplash. Willie goes out, he grabs his arm, and it, it sort of brings him back and thrusts him into Todd's wheelchair. He lands in Todd's lap. And there's an immediate panic because he's got a lot of bravado, right? He didn't want any of the other kids to see him sitting in the lap of the guy in a wheelchair. And I make sure he knows, I see you and I will remember this, right? I will tell the world. Todd grabs him, wraps his arms around Willie, and says, I love you, and lets him go. A couple of months later, the, the kids from OU went back to school. A couple of months later, I get a, an, a, a phone call from Todd. He wants to know, can I come back and work with you all summer long? Again, the wheels are turning in my head. I want to say, your time here did not go well. <laughs> right? Is there something not right in there? Do you remember? Were you there? You were not well received by your audience. But then I thought, well, he might lead that Bible study for me. So I said, come on, spend the summer with me. Todd arrives early before all the other interns. On Sunday, I'm going down for the afternoon to worship with some of the families down there. He wants to know if he can go. I say yes. I put his wheelchair in the back of my car. We head down to the city. We pull up next to the place where we're going to gather and worship. All the children are playing on the playground. I get out of the car. I'm going to go to the back and get the wheelchair out, bring it around for Todd, open his door for him, help him into his wheelchair. I'm getting the wheelchair out of the back of the car, and I hear this commotion, all of these children screaming, and it sounds like the, the noise is coming towards us. As I'm wheeling the wheelchair around, it, I look up, I see this mob of children coming toward our car before I can get to the door. All of these little hands are grabbing at the door and flinging it open and Willie is in the front and he jumps into the car. This is a true story. He jumps into the car, into Todd's lap, wraps his arms around his neck. Todd, you are back. <laughs> Never once in all of the times that I went to the city did they receive me that way. <laughs> Never once. Why is that? Why is that, church? Believers in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ. Because the story that we believe and the master that we serve, this is the way that his kingdom works. Amen. Those who are considered lowly are of great value in the kingdom of God. And James affirms to us, there is something that will be victor over judgment. You know, it's interesting. It is not the absence of judgment that is victor over judgment. Maybe that's a step in the right direction, but I think the absence of judgment requires very little of us. There's no cost it's not the absence of judgment that is the victor over judgment. It is mercy. She will triumph over judgment. It is the gathered people loving every human being the way they love themselves in the name of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. It is the mindfulness of the active presence of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ in every moment, in every face, in every human body, heart, and soul that we come into contact with. This triumphs over judgment. I, I, I read a, 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 a story 
Uh, Ken Follett is one of my favorite authors in, in, in the book, The Winter of the World. I think that's the one. He tells a story about Billy Twice. Everyone in Billy Twice's uh, village has a nickname. His real name is Billy Williams. So everyone calls him Billy Twice. John owns a shop. So they call him John the Shop. It's not overly creative. Everyone just has a little name, and his is Billy twice. And in Billy's village, when you become a certain age, every boy in the village at a certain age goes down into the mines. And that's where they will work for the rest of their lives. And every boy that is about Billy's age, who is about to turn that age, is both excited about a new kind of life and not going to school all day and terrified. Will they be able to handle life beneath the surface of the earth? When it's Billy's day, when it's Billy Twice's day to go down into the mines, he discovers that his guide, one of the veterans, is a man who has problems with Billy's family, doesn't like them, has a grievance against them. Billy doesn't know that every boy that goes down in the mines for the first time is put through a little bit of an initiation. Everyone has their own lantern. And every boy that goes down is taken deep within through this maze, deep within beneath the surface of the earth, back in the back corners of the mines and left alone, given a faulty lantern, left in the dark for about 30 minutes or an hour. Billy's guide takes him winding left and right, left and right, all alone, takes him to this corner of the mines and he's given this big, this big container and a shovel and all of this dirt and he's told to shovel until I come back to get you. On his way out, the guide stops and says, hey, your, your lantern looks like there's something wrong with it. Let me give you mine. That's the ruse. He takes the guide's lantern in, in full faith and trust. He's down here all alone. He must trust this one who has guided him here. He's not gone for very long and the light goes out and Billy cannot see his hand in front of his face. There's a great fear and panic that comes over him, but he's stuck here. He can't go wandering off looking for them or he might come into greater danger. He decides that to to buy time and to sort of still the panic, he will just work. And so he takes his shovel, he finds his shovel, he finds the dirt, he puts the shovel under the dirt. He, he, he wanders over and finds the container and he puts dirt in the container. He does it again and again and again until there is some sort of rhythm. And then he remembers that his mother has always told him they were a church going family. And she's always told him, Billy twice, don't you forget on his way out the door, Jesus is always with you wherever you go. Until this moment, he has always received this as a threat, right? <laughs> Jesus is watching you. On this day, it's hope. Is this true? Is this true that Jesus is always with you wherever you go? And so he decides, I'm going to sing every hymn that I can remember, every song that we've ever sung in church. They didn't have song books. They were a real first century church. And... uh, (laughs) Anyway, and uh, so he he remembers all these hymns. He starts singing them, praises to Jesus. And and over time, he he begins to believe. There was even a moment where he thought maybe he saw Jesus standing in the corner. He can't see the hand in front of his face, but he thought he saw him. And minutes and, and hours and a whole day goes by. He's left alone for a whole day in pitch black darkness. Just he and Jesus working together. Finally, his guide comes to get him. Oh, There's something wrong with your lamp. He responds, you know what's wrong with my lamp. They wander back to the rickety elevator that's going to take them back above the surface of the earth. They gather onto this little cart with all of the other veterans and newbies and they've got grins on their faces because they know about the initiation and think that he's been left for 30 minutes and so someone asks him, Billy, twice, how did it go today? And he says, well, my lamp went out and I was... I was in the dark all day. Now everyone on the elevator has become very sober, realizing that this young boy has been left all day in the dark. And one of them says, you must have been terrified all alone in the dark. And Billy's response is, yes, I was terrified, but I was not alone. Jesus was with me. One of the other young boys begins to snicker when he says that Jesus was with him, but none of the veterans do. Ken Follett writes, and from that day forward, they called him Billy with Jesus. 
That's what I want for you and me. This is mercy triumphing over judgment, dusty with our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. The gathered people with our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Stand with me, would you, church? Let me read one more word to you. From all people, Paul. Church, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's sing.